Good morning, everyone. We're just waiting just to get the numbers up and running with the attendees. Just give us a few minutes. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining the webinar um, hosted by Obscure and Palo Alto. I think we're going to get going. Uh, I'm sure we're going to have a lot more people joining us on the Zoom session, but I don't want to keep you guys waiting. Um, just two seconds. So just some housekeeping. Um, if you can all please keep your lines muted. Um, we also would be taking questions and answers in the question and answer section. We've got an amazing uh, panelist. Um, we've got uh, Matt Rhodes and Patrick uh, Bale from Palo Alto, a specialist in, in the cortex field, also to help answer some questions. So if you've got any questions during the session, please post them in the Q&A. Um, and then also just to keep in mind, we'd like you to, there's a, a nice incentive. So if you stay until the end, uh, you can learn and earn, obviously. Uh, so just a little drum roll. So Obscure have got an amazing uh, present uh, for anybody that can fill out the, the survey. They'll do a draw on the 24th and they'll be giving out uh, 2,000 Rand take a lot vouchers if you stay until the end. So please, I hope you enjoyed the demo uh, and the presentation on the Cortex uh, presentation. Um, yeah, thank you for coming. So just to give you some background, my name is Lee Tomkinson. I'm the Cortex uh, Specialist in South Africa. I recently joined the Palo Alto team. Uh, I've been for, here for about a month and a half. Um, I have been at previous vendors before, so my special uh, speciality was in the threat protection space. Um, I've helped multiple customers, um, obviously during uh, incidents, breaches, um, and I just, you know, got extremely excited when I saw what Palo Alto was actually doing from an XDR point of view and the XOR solution. I've also got my colleague, uh, Jake Vol uh, Volvart, who's the core system engineer, and he's also just absolutely loves the XOR uh, platform. So he'll be helping me uh, with the presentation today. Um, so we will be switching between our presentations. So first of all, I'll, I'll be kicking off. So today's agenda, what we're going to be talking about is just obviously the emerging challenges in uh, security operations. Uh, we're also going to be talking about what Cortex is. Um, 
then we're going to explain what XDR uh, is and also go through the different licensing options that we have. Uh, Matt Rhodes is on, on the panelist, as I mentioned, so if you've got any questions around pricing or licensing, you can actually post them in the Q&A. And obviously, we've got Obscure also on, on the, the panelists also to answer your commercial questions. Um, then we will go into a, a XDR demo. Um, the XDR demo is quite technical, but um, I'll try to explain exactly the step-by-step. -step. It's a very intuitive console and just uh, step you through a nice XDR demo. And then I'll pass over to Jakes. Jakes will cover the XSOR uh, platform. He'll also go through the different licensing options, and then he will give you a short XSOR demo as well, and then we'll answer any of the Q&A questions. So if we look at the threat landscape, uh, if any of us are in the security industry, we can see that throughout the years, the security uh, problems have changed. Uh, they've definitely elevated. If you look at what customers are going through, uh, we've seen it from you know your typical macro type malware to now your your sophisticated ransomware attacks, uh, even your file list based living off the land attacks. I'm seeing that more and more with customers, um, and I've been involved in some of uh, you know some of the customers. Uh, in public sector or whether it be in the banking institutions uh, that have had various different breaches whether it comes uh, to uh, compromised accounts or you know down to bad configuration on on their technologies uh, and allowing a, a compromise to happen or vulnerabilities within their systems um, there's a multitude of solutions that need to take place to actually protect a customer's site and the problem is 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 sometimes there's just too much to actually manage and too much alerts and and that's overwhelming right for any any type of customer and any type of partner that might be supporting a customer So I really like this slide because it gives you a picture of what Palo Alto Networks is about. It's got a comprehensive security approach. We've got our Strata, which is our most comprehensive product suite for security operations, empowering enterprises. And that really is our next-gen firewalls. You know, people know Palo Alto and they know it's a strong brand and they know the next-gen firewalls. Uh, so we've got a well-established customer base for that. Um, and then we've obviously got the um, Prisma. The Prisma is our unified cloud native security platform, and that really focuses on the cloud security, cloud compute. Um, and then we've got the Cortex uh, solution uh, platform that we'll be talking about today. And that really is quite exciting. So it, it looks at the advanced threat detection and response. It, look at, it looks at our sole platform for orchestration and automation, and it gives you complete and timely visibility. And what's really great is we're starting to, um, we've got built-in integrations between all these different pillars into Cortex as well. So why do security teams struggle? And this is really a, a question that whether you be a partner providing a managed service to a customer or a customer having their own uh, SOC internally, uh, the problem that most of uh, customers or partners face is that there's just too much noise, right? So you've got a lot of solutions, uh, whether it be uh, all of them feeding into a, a specific SIM, um, you know, or looking at firewall uh, logs or an, an antivirus or an EDR component. Um, there's a lot of uh, information, a lot of logs, a lot of alerts, and to try to sift through that, especially when you're going through a breach. I don't know, I'm sure some of you on the line have been involved in a, in a breach or a incident response for a customer. Uh, the amount of information that you need to sift through, whether it's uh, AD logs, and then try to sift out the information that's important, and then try to piece that together, it can be really, really overwhelming, and sometimes something can be missed. Uh, also, just as I touched on the amount of information that you get, it's, a, it's down to too many products to piece together, right? So you're looking at all the various different uh, technologies that you have in place, and it's not a lack of technology. Sometimes you have so much technology, and it's all sitting in a siloed platform, and you're having to look at the various different uh, technologies that work differently, that need different skill, and um, you're having to understand and try to piece this information together. Um, there's also too many manual and re repetitive actions. So especially for a security analysts, if, if they're looking at um, trying to piece this information together, uh, there's a lot of manual 
work that they need to do to actually check those systems, provide health checks, or even start to look at the information and, and understand what needs to take place. Even the remediation actions can be completely repetitive. And there must be a much more intuitive way or a much more automated way to respond. So when we look at transforming SecOps, uh, you'll tend to find that most customers are usually sitting on the less mature side. You do find in certain industries that they are a lot more mature, but most of them, if they had to be honest, are sitting on the more reactive side. And part of our job, uh, whether it be a, a partner or even being an internal person for a customer supporting their security, we wanna obviously improve the maturity and move, uh, allow them to, to uh, increase their time to respond and their time to remediate and, and respond quicker. So what is Cortex? So it's time for a different approach to SecOps. We have the opportunity to fix what's broken together uh, and we've got various different pillar, uh, you know, solutions within the Cortex pillar. So first we've got the Cortex XDR, uh, our prevent solution, which sits on the endpoint. So previously you knew our technology as traps, it's now been rebranded as prevent and obviously multiple features brought into it to, to mature it. Uh, extremely powerful solution that focuses on prevention. Um, it helps, uh, it's got built-in machine learning. Um, it also looks at behavioral analytics and it's really powerful when it comes to actually picking up the unknown threats. Uh, we've also got something called Cortex XDR Pro, and that's where our, uh, our XDR, our um, enhanced uh, incident and response, our EDR component sits. Uh, and this is extremely powerful when it would takes the information from your endpoint, your cloud, and your network, it ingests that data and starts to make analytical decisions on what is actually happening in your environment, giving you full visibility. We've also got another solution called Cortex XOR, previously known as Demisto, and that is our SOAR technology. What's fabulous about this product is it's technology agnostic. We can ingest uh, different data, uh, whether it be from a SIM, third-party applications. We partner with multiple vendors. Uh, we've got built-in uh, integrations, and obviously my, my colleague Jakes is going to touch on that a lot more. So when we really look at what Cortex is made up of, uh, you can pretty much say if you're using the full Cortex pillar, you've got case management, you've got security orchestration and automation, which comes with SOAR. We've now got built-in threat intel management, which, which can come with, into, uh, with XOR, uh, plus our autofocus, sorry, autofocus into our XDR. We've got real-time collaboration, which is our war rooms that you can find in XOR, where teams can actually collaborate on, on specific incidents. We've got investigation and response, uh, which comes with the XDR component. And then we've got our machine le learning capability built into all our technologies uh, to help make better decisions and not relying just on the decisions of the security analyst. Uh, we've also got the endpoint protection, which we talked about, which is our prevention technology that sits on the endpoint. So let's jump into Cortex XCR. So why do customers need Cortex XCR? Okay, and it's really down to the fact that today investigations and containment take too long. Uh, each alert provides limited context. Uh, the problem, as we mentioned, is there's just too many incomplete and inaccurate alerts. And the problem is, is then you tend to find that teams spend a lot of time looking at the wrong information and, uh, you know, possibly missing something. We've also got siloed security tools to contribute to the problem. So when you've got siloed, the siloed approach to pro products and there's not that centralized view, um, it's very difficult to start to stitch those events together. So you need some kind of way of bringing that information in. And you'll see a lot of the vendors out there are now trying to actually bring that central management, that central view. Um, and what's really great about XCR is it really does do that um, quite well. And the fact that we can bring in third party data uh, from other firewalls means that, you know, we open to, to, to other vendors. Also with the visibility on blind spots, uh, teams can't detect attacks quickly enough. Um, so we really need to get a lot more agile in the way that we actually pick it up by using data and analytics. 
So what are the key differentiators? So as we mentioned, uh, we've got best-in-class prevention, which obviously can sit on the endpoint. It has the machine learning capability and the behavioral analytics built into it, plus exploit mitigation. Um, and then we've also won full visibility, right? So our XDR solution, uh, what's really great is that we can actually feed the network, the endpoints, and cloud information and start to stitch those incidents into one uh, incidents that you can actually see what's happening in your environment. Uh, we've also got better security outcomes by using our artificial intelligence uh, and automation within the solutions. So when we look at gaining uh, the, to gain enterprise scale and visibility, this is just a really great diagram showing you exactly how this works. So we've got our network, our next-gen firewalls, which can feed information into our Cortex data lake. Think of our Cortex data lake as a place where all we feed all this information into our endpoint, our cloud, and our third-party data. And then Cortex XDR being the brain of it, plugs into the Cortex data lake and uses this information to actually apply its machine learning and data uh, analytics to create incidents from the multiple learns that we're receiving from all of these technologies. Again, so supercharge your investigation response. You'll see this in, in um, the demo quite nicely. So Cortex XR helps you accelerate investigations by providing a complete picture of each alert with root cause analysis. Uh, so what's really great about it is it gives you a unified instant engine, right? So you bring in all the alerts. It also helps bring down the amount of alerts. So if you think about it, you can have on average about 50 alerts coming in and it will raise one particular incident. Obviously the number can change, but on average we take about 50 alerts and we make one incident. Uh, we've also got automated root cause analysis, so it can reveal the root cause. This is the causa uh, causality chain, uh, and we'll talk more about that during the demo. But you can actually then start to piece together, based on all the different alerts that you're receiving from the different control points, what was the cause? What was the primary cause of that particular incident? And as you can see in the snapshot, you can see that Chrome was uh, the, the primary owner of the casualty chain, and then as you see the spawned processes after that. So this is phenomenal when it comes to actually looking at an incident, trying to understand how did something malicious get into your network. Then we've also got an integrated response. And what we mean by that is there's various different responses that we can actually provide. I've seen some really great XDR tools. I've had my hands on uh, several and I'm blown away by the amount of responses that you can actually do with XDR. You can actually do live terminal uh, onto a machine um, and actually perform some uh, steps to actually remediate on the machine. Um, you can also uh, perform interactive run commands or scripts using Python or PowerShell uh, for in-depth forensic investigations. You can stop uh, specific processes by opening up a remote task manager. There is so many things that you can actually do to perform remediation rather than having to get that desktop guy to run down and find that, that machine. Plus, you can also isolate the machine from the network. What I really like about this picture is, again, is it just shows you how Cortex XDR consumes data from the Cortex data lake and can correlate and stitch together those logs across your different log sensors and derive a casualty and a timeline. Cortex XDR app provides complete visibility into all your data in the Cortex data lake. Uh, and this is extremely powerful when it comes to looking at everything in one view. So if we look at before Cortex XDR, I think this is just a really great depiction of what actually happens. So you've got your core security analyst sitting in the middle, having to look at all these different solutions uh, and, and try to take the information and cross-correlate it, whether it be in a SIM or whether it be a manual process, this poor person or this team of people are obviously going to suffer from uh, alert fatigue. You look on uh, afterwards when you introduce Cortex XDR and straight away you see that we feed this information in into the Cortex data lake. Cortex XDR then uh, you know, provides the stitching in the background and straight away from, uh, let's say for an example, phishing alert, it now can stitch that together and tell you exactly how that phishing alert got uh, brought into the system. Really, really powerful. So raising the bar for XDR. So 
what else does Cortex XR bring you? And I think this is a really powerful conversation. It can actually bring third party data. So we can now analyze not only from our Palo Alto firewalls, but we actually leverage off your firewalls, um, whether you've bought checkpoints, Cisco Fortinet and Forcepoint, or any other third party uh, firewall, as, not, as long as we can get in a CEPH format, uh, we can actually bring that data in and no longer will a customer have to go now purchase an additional network sensor if they're purchasing an XDR solution. Uh, you can leverage off the firewalls, use the logs from there, and then consolidate it using our endpoints uh, with the XDR. Uh, you can also fully integrate the solutions with endpoint, now seamlessly integrate into XDR as mentioned. Um, if you decide that you don't want to use our endpoint, we do have something called Pathfinder. We can use Pathfinder to uh, deploy a dissolvable agent, which will then go fetch the information and pull it off. What's also really great about our XCR agent, it can sit comfortably with another solution, uh, another AV type solution on the endpoint, if the customer so chooses. Uh, we've also got machine learning uh, driven locally, uh, so it will use the engine to analyze and create a more accurate improvement on the actual um, endpoint. So this is just a really great uh, snapshot again uh, of showing the different type of third party firewall logs. So every organization has a multi-vendor security landscape, sometimes including more than one type of firewall. So by us ingesting third party firewall logs, Cortex FDR is now delivering on its vision of comprehensive behavioral analytics that extends all to the network. In addition to firewall logs, Cortex XDR has the ability to ingest a wide range of network alerts into our unique incident view, uh, stitching together all the alert types to reveal the root cause of a single incident. This also means that you don't have to be an exclusive Palo Alto network shop to uh, take advantage of Cortex XCR's powerful data stitching, uh, machine learning and simplified investigation capability across your entire network. As we mentioned, if you can bring it in through syslog CEF file, or if we can uh, integrate via you know, your, the data from your SIM uh, using the Cortex XCR API, we can ingest that data uh, and use that within XDR. Just another thing that you'll hear, and a lot of the times when you see the marketing around XDR, and even if you look at the Gartner reports, uh, you know, the MITRE attack coverage uh, is quite important when you're looking at a, a, an EDR or an XDR solution. So Cortex XDR provides the best endpoint visibility and the highest coverage across different attack techniques. Um, you can actually go onto the MITRE attack uh, uh, page and look at the latest results. And you will see that um, Cortex uh, XCR did very well in the testing. We did about 88% uh, in coverage. That was 121 of the 136 techniques that they expect us to cover. And obviously, as the product gets um, enhancements, we try to add additional techniques that we can actually provide coverage for. And then just to summarize, so Cortex XCR, so the real value comes in when we reduce the risk of breach. So we improve your security posture with complete visibility. Uh, we allow you to accurately uh, detect attacks and we also simplify the investigation and we provide rapid response. Uh, we also help increase SecOps efficiency. So we give them the more visibility on what they should be focusing on, uh, providing a, a much better way to actually look at uh, what's actually happening when it comes to a breach and what type of critical alerts they need to focus on. We also reduce the complexity by simplifying detection and response workflows, uh, which, which therefore lowers the, the total cost of ownership and provides the increase uh, for the SecOps. Just to go into the licensing for XDR, so the different type of license options that we have is Cortex XCR. Uh, we've got the Cortex XCR Prevent. Uh, this is a price per endpoint. This is uh, the old traps, which has now been uh, rebranded to XCR Prevent. So you literally price it out based on the amount of endpoints that you have, and you get 30 days of log retention with that uh, SKU, uh, plus you get the endpoint management device control and the outbound in, in, in integration. Next, you've got the Cortex XCR Pro. 
this is the one that I highly recommend that customers take or, or customers look at. Uh, this includes the, uh, the XTR, the data analytics, the, the endpoint threat of, uh, incident and response, um, and that's also built uh, through counting the amount of endpoints. You get 30 days log retention, plus you get the EDR uh, collection, analytics, uh, and so much more, so, uh, plus the third-party alert uh, integrations. Then the next one is the Cortex SCR Pro. And like I said, when you're building this up, if you want to take our endpoint and ingest the network uh, logs, you would probably take two of the, the, the different SKUs and build up a solution. But basically Cortex SCR Pro per terabyte, um, you would actually calculate the amount of uh, space that you'd need on our Cortex data lake. And then you would actually Price this out per terabyte, um, and and this would give you the the ingestion for your network's uh, logs. There is a sizing calculator that you can find on this link. Um, this actually helps you build out exactly how you would size your your uh, Cortex data lake for pricing. Uh, if there's any questions that you have around this, because uh, this is not really based on the, the latest version, uh, they are changing the cal calculator and will be updating this. Uh, but if you need any assistance, reach out to Obscure, reach out to Palo Alto, uh, myself, and we can help you uh, size your solution. There's also some really helpful information on uh, which I wanted to share. So specifically on the virtual hands-on workshops, um, I just think this is just phenomenal. So um, there are virtual hand workshops. You can look at the latest schedule here. Uh, they're about a three to four hour session that you can actually go join the virtual workshop and have a hands-on experience with Cortex XCR. It's extremely uh, uh, impressive when it comes to something that they're giving away to customers and partners for free uh, and it really is of value so i would strongly recommend go look at the schedule and get your hands on this product you'll soon see how intuitive this product actually is and then there's also just a really nice ebook okay i'm going to quickly uh, swap into the xdr demo uh, just before I go, I'm going to give you a short brief overview of what we're going to be going through. So we've got uh, a spear phishing attack. So we've got Colleen, who is an avid Marvel, uh, you know, uh, customer. She's gone to a Comic Con and she is mad about Marvel. She uh, experiences a spear phishing attack where she gets a, a, an invite from someone that she thinks she knows and she clicks on a link and she thinks that it's the latest Marvel MP4 and it turns out it's something a lot more malicious. What I'm also going to just uh, would like to share with you, so we've got an upset framework that we also um, cover. Um, this can be really helpful during an incident. Uh, so when you look at the responsibility of an incident response team, it's to determine the full impact of a breach. Uh, so to apply this acronym uh, to uh, an actual breach is, is just phenomenal. So if you look at it, what XDR is going to help you answer all the questions to, uh, to, to these specific ones. So what users are involved in the actual breach? And you'll see near the end of the demo, we'll have the answers to all of these. What persistent mechanisms were used to stay in the environment? So when we talk about persistence, did they use scheduled tasks? Did they uh, entrench themselves in registry keys? How did they create persistence when they were in the network? What systems, internal or external, are involved in the incident? So we'll understand what host names, IP addresses were involved in the actual breach. What end game or mission objective is the adversary afterwards? So when during an incident, you have to understand what was the goal of this person coming into my network? Were, were they trying to steal credentials? Were they trying to get data? What data were they trying to get? We need to understand the, the mission or the objective of the adversary. And then what tactics, techniques, and procedures in the adversary using? So were they using the full attack chain? Were they doing reconnaissance, discovery? Um, what were they doing? Were they trying to take data exfiltration? Uh, we have to understand what kind of ta tactics they were using. Okay, so I'm going to jump into the demo. Okay, so this is the home dashboard of Cortex XDR. What's really great about this uh, 
this dashboard is there's a lot that you can actually do to to streamline it to the way you'd like it to look first of all there's just a nice little thing here called light or dark so depending on what kind of look you prefer for your xcr solution i like the dark look um, you can change that. There's also several different widgets that can be created for the actual home dashboard. As you can see, if you uh, click on the three little dots here, you can actually change it whether you want it to be a number kind of graph or a, a circular graph. Uh, there's various different things that you can do. And in each of these widgets, you can actually drill down depending on what you want to do. So for example, if I wanted to drill down uh, into instance, I'd just click on that and it would take me to the next page. Now, obviously just for speed, I've actually gone and re uh, opened up my tabs just so that we save some time, just in case of the lag to the lab. Um, and just, uh, I'd like to just share this disclaimer before I carry on. So we, for this demo to take place, we had to disable all the prevention within our technologies, whether that be our next-gen firewalls or whether it be our XTR agents, we disabled the prevention technologies in those to allow the attack to occur so that we could show you how if something had to bypass your controls, whether it be bad configuration or you know something else, we can actually show you how you can find that through the, following the chain. Okay, so just to keep uh, that in mind. So as we do, if you want, you've got various different menus at the top here. Uh, for example, if I click on investigation, I can go in, down into incidents or I can drill down from the bottom side here. Uh, I'm going to click on there just because I've opened up the tab. And this is usually what uh, the triage uh, responder would be matched with. So they would see the latest incidents. Most of the time, they'd probably sort them by severity. Okay, and obviously they're going to focus on what's high. And the one that we're going to focus on exactly what I was saying is the spear, the spear phishing attack. As you can see, a lot of stitching has already occurred. No changes have been made to this demo. Um, they pretty much they did the attack and the stitching happened behind the scenes. You can already see straight away, it can see which machines have been involved and you can see the status is already under investigation. So what you do to actually look at this incident is you'd right click and you'd say view incident. Okay. Straight away, we go into the incident and as you can see, it's got incident ID 131, the name called spear phishing with Kazar and Dark Comet with uh, database exfiltration. Okay, and straight away, you can, you can see it's under investigation. You can actually change the status depending on what you'd like. You can also assign the call to a specific user. So if you wanted to, you could choose who you would like to assign the call to. What's really great now is uh, even with the triage responder, straight away, you've got this information where it shows you key artifacts. So as you can see, you've got numerous amounts of key artifacts, whether it be, um, a whole bunch of uh, files, processes, and as you can see, some of the skulls attached to it, those are already uh, shown as malicious files. You've also got some benign files, uh, which uh, have obviously been involved in the attacks and have been used in some way for malicious purposes. Okay, And as you can see, this is where the, stitch, uh, the stitching that I was talking about. So this is one incident, but this specific file has been involved in 24 alerts. This mummy cat has been involved in three. So as you can see, multiple alerts in one incident. I imagine a security analyst having to look at all those alerts and having to stitch this together. XDR has done that for you, okay? You've also got your threat intelligence, which we can integrate into XDR. So as you can see, we've got integration into our wildfire. And what's really great about that is that we've already had submissions of these files to our wildfire. And if you click on this, you can actually look at the analysis report from wildfire and start to see you know what the analysis was on these particular files we've also got integration with virus total um, as you can see the more threat intelligence that we have within xcr it just allows the security analysts to actually understand that this definitely is something that they need to look at it, it counteracts all the stuff around all the questions around is this a false positive so we see straight away that virus total has already said out of the 65 vendors on virus total 50 of them are saying that this is a malicious file obviously we do know the name mummy cats quite well uh, it could be named something else um, but even if it was a different file hash and it was picked up by virus total on our wildfire we'd know this file is bad news 
We've also got access to autofocus. So if you click on these little tags here, you'll get a little bit more information from our Unit 42 team who uh, look at threats on a daily basis and create uh, you know, intelligence around what we're seeing. Uh, you can also pivot into these. So for example, if I wanted to pivot into this one, I could right click on it. Let me just click out, right click on it, go to virus total or go to autofocus. So that's what I've done for the autofocus one. Just to show you, we pivot straight into autofocus and we get a nice sample analysis of exactly what's happening. And this can be used during the investigation. Uh, then if we look on the right hand side at the key acids, straight away we've got a nice summary of exactly what machines have been involved. We can see uh, there are three host names plus two IP addresses and we've got a, full, a few users that have also been involved. And again, the stitching has occurred. So numerous alerts attached to this uh, and stitching has been uh, performed onto this incident. So we know straight away, we've really got a good idea of which machines are involved in this, in this breach. On the uh, bottom side, uh, we've also got alerts and we've got insights. What's really great about insights, if you right click on it, straight away you get to see what type of tactics and techniques were used during this, uh, this, this particular breach. So you can see straight away under category, we've got persistence, we've got some discovery, we've also got some uh, droppers, reconnaissance, um, we've got a whole bunch of things, lateral movement, persistence. So we've, we've got the full uh, attack chain here. Let's go back to alerts. So what we're going to do is we're going to start to dive in a little bit deeper. So if you want to right click on something and investigate, or, or sorry, to analyze further, that's exactly what I've done. So what's really great here, let's just uh, go into this. This is known as the causality view, uh, the causality timeline. Okay, And what's really great about this is this is where the stitching has happened, right? So straight away we see that the male client that uh, C. Collier uh, went and clicked on Thunderbird. She obviously received an email um, and straight away when she clicked on the attachment, it, it uh, extracted it with 7-zip. Um, the file was called Avengers Endgame. Straight away, you can see this is a double extension. If we click on the top little triangle, we see that there are two alerts attached to this. So we've got one wildfire, so obviously it was submitted to wildfire and it was seen as malicious. Uh, plus, we've also got two other alerts. So we can see straight away our uh, XR BIOC. Now, BIOC stands for Behavioral Indicator of Compromise. So these are built within the XDR system. You can also create your own custom ones, but these are rules that detect the behavior of a process, registry file, or, or network activity, okay? And this has picked up the double extension and obviously creates an alert on this. Once this was uh, extracted, it obviously did something malicious and it went and dropped the Quasar client, which is a remote access tool uh, that's now allowing the adversary to actually uh, perform various different types of actions like reconnaissance. So we look on here again, Wildfire actually picked this up. Um, and then if we look again, Quasar Rat Command Control Center. So that was actually our next gen firewall that actually picked up that there was a command and control traffic detected. Now, just remember, if we had those prevention uh, features turned on our next-gen firewall, we probably would have stopped this. But for this uh, demo, we've actually switched off those features just to show you exactly what would happen. We already see a remote IP that is trying to connect to, uh, and that's obviously to, uh, to either download additional um, uh, malicious tools or to uh, have data exfiltration uh, performed out of the network. Okay, and straight away, we've already got something there that we could go block. Next, what happens is it opens up a command prompt and straight away you see it spawn itself again. So it went and spawned itself again as Quasar Client. Now, if you go read up about Quasar Client, Quasar Client can actually start itself up in elevated privileges. So basically now Quasar has got full admin rights to Collier's uh, machine, okay? And that's quite dangerous. So if we scroll up here and click on command, straight away we start to see some interesting stuff. On the, on the right hand side, let me just actually zoom out a bit. 
we see a whole bunch of commands here. We see mummy cats being run. We see ARP requests, okay? If we actually wanna see a bit more information of exactly that in a more summarized uh, fashion, let me show you here what we can click on. Okay, we can click on process. And straight away under process, we've got 18 results. Now, if you look, this is the timeline. So we are going uh, backwards. So if we look up from here, it starts a command line and it starts to do uh, an op minus a. So it's trying to find out any op requests plus any routes. It also is looking at net stats. So proper reconnaissance actually happening within the environment. It's also running a system info to find out more information. It's checking if there's any uh, shared um, network drives. It's also looking at the Windows uh, event tools. Uh, it's looking at, it's doing a net user for the domain. It's also trying to see who's part of the finance group, for example, who's the contractors. It's looking for domain admins, right? And then it runs Mimikatz to obviously try to do a password, uh, password dump. Next, we see another command line getting run. Oh, and straight away, what do we see? We see a scheduled task. There is our persistence. So what this does is it's trying to embed itself into the machine uh, so that it has persistence. So whenever this machine turns on again, it can start to do exact all the reconnaissance again. Okay. And we see straight away uh, the command line running again, and we see some interesting things happening here as well. So we see PSXX running. And straight away, if we click on the PSXX64, what do we see in the command line here? We see it actually trying to uh, UNC to another machine. And now we can see that it's actually got access to a password. So the password credential uh, dump has worked. They've now uh, compromised uh, W. Sanchez's account. They've got the password and they're trying to do additional, um, uh, you know, attacks on, on those machines. So if I had to go back to the incident, I can also see now, okay, W. Sanchez, I think that something is also happening on this machine. So I've actually opened up uh, just to look at what's actually happening on one of these machines. So if we look at the PS exec on this machine, we can see yet again, the exact similar type of uh, files being dropped and executed and the same commands being run, okay? Um, let's just look at the different alerts here. and the different processes. So there's various different uh, commands that you can actually look at here, some of the network stuff. Okay, you can see the network outgoing here. Um, what also interesting is we've got another machine that was also involved. Now this machine was involved, but it didn't have an XCR agent on. So the alert that was actually stitched into the incident was actually picked up by the firewall. So we could actually see that this machine was also contributing to the callback that uh, this tool actually does, the RAT tool does. So again, we can actually see that this machine was involved, but it didn't even have an XCR agent. Okay, so let's go back to here. Um, then if we click on here, let me just see what else we can see. We can see the double extension. And as you can see, all the different commands running out here. So straight away to a triage or a person who's in charge of this would definitely know that there's something quite serious going on here. And they'd be able to uh, turn this over to the incident responders and be able to show them that they'd need to actually get this further looked at. Also, when you click on the command line here, you can also start to see other information. So you can start to see here that now, since they've gone and uh, you know performed those PS execs, we can actually see now that they've gone and accessed Microsoft SQL tool, okay, which is sitting locally on this machine, and now they start creating backups of that database. So we can safely say that they're trying to access that database and they're trying to uh, make a backup and take uh, the data out the network. So yeah, there we go. So 
it just shows you how powerful cortex XCR is. Uh, there's so much more to show when it comes to cortex XCR. I mean, there's a whole bunch of responses. We could have gone through the BIOCs and how to create uh, custom queries. Um, also uh, do a live terminal to a machine. But because of time, I'd like to say thank you for allowing me to show you the, um, the demo. And obviously, if you're in, uh, interested, we could obviously do a much more deep dive into a demo. I'm going to hand you over to my colleague, Jakes. Uh, thanks, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for that, Lee. I really do appreciate it. that was a really great presentation. And um, guys, switching gears, um, good morning to everyone on the on the attendees list. Great to see everyone, some familiar names and faces and a lot of new names as well. Uh, my name is Jake Spolfot. I'm the systems engineer at Palo Alto Networks, looking after the, uh, what we would kind of deem the core, core technologies. I have been um, kind of nominated to kind of be a, a bit of a champion, I suppose, around XOR. I take it personally as well, because I really enjoy the technology. I'm not gonna go too much into history. I have, uh, again, been across different vendors, as most of you would have known. Some of you don't know. I have had experience in uh, different kind of vendors as well. Um, kicking into the presentation, guys, um, I really want to have a look and kind of define and demystify what, what SOAR is. Um, and if we look at it and just kind of break down the acronym, we start talking about SOAR, it's a security, orchestration, automation, and response tool, right? Um, and in this, we start looking at three real pillars. We look at the orchestration, we'll look at automation and response. And I've got a demo for you towards the end as well. So we can see how this all actually fits together, right? Um, again, looking at it from an orchestration perspective, we're looking at running playbooks, looking at working through workflows in a logical organized plan in this scenario. And again, controlling and activating security products right from a central location. Automation, um, and again, we'll get a bit more deeper into this a little bit, a little bit later. Um, we look at automated scripts, extensible product integrations, and that's where you know, I start to get very excited and you'll kind of hear through my voice about the ability to integrate with you know, a lot of different tools that I see in enterprises day to day. We'll start looking at, again, things like machine execution of playbooks and tasks, and then it goes hand in hand, right, to be able to say, well, I need to respond. How do we respond? And we'll look at things like case management. We'll look at, again, analysis and reporting. Collaboration is also quite key, right? So uh, in this day and age, unfortunately, we need to kind of really co collaborate with our different teams, whether it be our, our NOX, our SOX, whether it be our DevOps, our SecOps engineers. Uh, we need to start really kind of bringing all those people together as well. So, having a quick squiz, um, Palo Alto Networks went and uh, acquired Demisto, which again in, in its segment and its market was its uh, was it was the champion. So again, for sword technologies, Demisto, we as Palo Alto Networks really saw the value in them, and we've onboarded them. And subsequently, we've gone through a little bit of a name change once we've done these, this onboarding. But this is what the picture looked like before, right? We had, again, third-party tools. We had some integrations. Um, again, playbook-driven automatic, uh, automated actions. Um, this gives you pretty much a before picture as to what the most I look like. And today, we look at it in a very different light. We look at it in a, in a more simplified manner, right? So we look at it and say, well, these are the, are the casing kind of pillars that we've kind of expanded on and said, well, we want to focus heavily on automation orchestration, real-time collaboration, case management, and we've added threat intel management. So again, the likes of your ISACs, your likes of the open source, your premium threat feeds, and our very own autofocus by Palo Alto Networks as well, right? So again, just giving you an idea of the breadth as to where we sit with Cortex XOR at the moment. All right, so when we, when we talk about, again, being able to do things like responding and automating, and we say, well, you know, a playbook, what is a playbook? And if you think about a playbook, a playbook would be a mapping of logical sequen sequential tasks that could be done manually. But in this scenario, we've got the ability for Cortex XOR to run these playbooks for us and actually do this in an in a automated fashion, right? And with over 350 vendor integrations, now just think about that for a second, right? So we're talking about being extensible and being integrated with the likes of our competitors, right? So the likes of a Fortinet, the likes of a checkpoint and so forth, right? And we'll look at the different categories as we break it down in a bit of time. Um, but again, it gives us the ability to say, well, we, we pretty much receive these alerts, we respond to them. And then we go say, well, hang on, we need to actually manage these incidents. So in managing these incidents, we look at ingesting, we then search and query all the security incidents 
and we table it up with a view. And the view here, again, can be customized. We can go into it into a demo, but it really gives us an idea of things like how many, how many incidents we have, what kind of SLAs do we have, uh, what does our mean time to detect, our mean time to respond, for example, say. So again, we'll get into this uh, as we go through the, the actual demo. And then again, we'll look at collaboration, right? So collaboration in a threat hunting or in a security analyst's world. Um, again, that would be a matter of having to say, well, let me go and approach different teams and gather information in different places. And we'll understand and I'll show you pretty much what a war room is, how we do automated documentation, for example, say. Um, again, this is all part of the uh, collaborate and learn as well. All right, looking at uh, Cortex XOR, um, and obviously this is a, a workflow automation engine. Um, I mean, diving a little bit deeper into this, you can have a look at by the graphic and see that, you know, this is a phishing demo work plan, and this is very similar to the actual real life demo I'll give you as well. But we pretty much will receive an email, we'll process this email and say, well, hang on, you know, let's have a look and respond to this and respond to this phishing email. But we want to enrich it. And what do we mean by enriching? We mean by having a look at different uh, different, I, I don't know, different areas in the network, and maybe for my thread feeds, for example, sake, we want to understand, collect all the IP addresses from this actual email that might be malicious. We want to understand the URLs. We want to understand the attachments and so forth, and really start to get some more insights around it and enrich and understand what was actually going, instead of manually having to strip out and look at um, uh, this actual phishing mail, for example. Sake. So in this scenario here, again, we, we talked about and boast hundreds of product integrations, thousands of security actions, and a visual playbook editor. And again, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to be able to understand and have a coding background, but you can visually actually go and build this playbook. And you can, there are hundreds of other books as well, but you can go build your own playbooks. So for me, to give you a bit of an idea, we had an internal challenge and I decided to build a playbook that was kind of useful for me in a day-to-day day -day kind of like world. So having a service provider background, I wanted to be able to kind of automate certain tasks. And what I did is I created a playbook that was basically able to go and check on silly things like roots and go and say, well, hang on, let me go check if this root's populated on this firewall. If not, okay, cool. I can email the Misto or a Cortex X in this scenario, and it would go and add roots for me. It would go and do commits for me, for example, on an next gen firewall. That just gives you an idea of how far you can pretty much take your own playbooks as well. From an incidents perspective, in this scenario over here, you'll see the graphic in front of you. You'll be able to see that we can now actually have a look at the incidents from different um, severities, from different types. And we're not just necessarily talking about phishing. We might be looking at onboarding new users. We might look at um, managing devices that are lost, for example, say, right? But also you want to tie this back to a service level as well, to an SLA. So again, giving us the ability to track this with metrics, dashboards, and reporting as well. When we're talking about collaboration, one of the nice things around the war room is to be able to say, well, I can add, let's say, for example, I want to add Lee as my colleague into the war room. I'll add her in and I can run queries directly from the actual uh, war room to go and say, well, let me go and have a look and see. Maybe there was a specific user um, in this scenario. It might be Jenny that I want to go and have a look and investigate a bit further. But all this information, all these commands that we're running inside this war room are pretty much all contained. Or it's actually there for an investigation, right? So when you need to produce documentation, instead of having a look at disparate text files and Word documents and things that are all over the show, we've got it all in one actual uh, virtual war room. And again, this gives us the ability to create auto documentation in this scenario. Those of you who are mobile crazy as well, yes, we do have a mobile app as well for Cortex XOR as well. So again, giving administrators and giving uh, teams and managers the ability to assign incidents to users, to be able to have a, have a look from a device and say, well, cool, let me have a look and see how we're tracking with today's incidents. Uh, again, this is just a more visual, uh, visual response and a little easier kind of ease of use to be able to kind of consume this and obviously still uh, keeping track with what's happening as well. So agile incident management here, keeping responses running, and then obviously con connecting with context in this scenario. Having a look from a threat intel management platform as well, we've got the ability to obviously consume a lot of different uh, th threat feeds in this scenario, but really we want to have a look at kind of making, making life a little bit easier, right? Aggregating, making, making sure we don't have deduplicates, uh, managing indicators at scale, for example, sake, and just really making smarter incident response decisions in this scenario. So closing the loop in this, in this, in this uh, scenario as well. Again, looking at the breadth of Cortex XOR and the use cases, 
Um, again, from alert sources to enriching and responding, um, there are a variety of things we can do in this scenario here. So security operations, for example, some examples of these could use case and password resets, right? Unusual uh, users traveling, uh, SSL certificate checks, for example, IT onboarding and offboarding. From a cloud security perspective, um, in this scenario, we could do Cortex XOR, uh, could look at coordinating responses across cloud and on-premise infrastructures, for example, Pokemon. Um, again, so one of the use cases I'll chat about a little bit later, but again, it was how we were able to kind of plug into, let's say, for example, AWS Guard Duty and go and check if ports were secure or not secure and kind of be able to remediate that on the fly as well. To give you an idea of the ecosystem that Cortex XOR has, this will give you a, a nice idea of the base and this is just a couple that I've actually tabled up over here. So we can look at things like analytics and scenes. So again, the likes of a Splunk, the likes of a curator, log rhythms and so forth. Very easy to kind of uh, add to the actual Cortex XOR. So again, we would add an integration for this. Um, again, in most scenarios, we kind of drive this utilizing APIs in, in this scenario. We can do obviously different forms of integration as well. From a threat intelligence perspective, we can see pretty much a couple of the vendors there, malware analysis, endpoints, network security, authentication, ticketing, messaging. So again, out of the box, there's just a wide variety of um, integrations that we can actually utilize with Cortex XOR. So looking at Cortex XOR and having a look at the value in this scenario, we're looking at standardizing and scaling processes, right? So again, imagine being able to say, well, I want to be able to reduce my weekly alerts from 10,000 to 500. Now, in some organizations, there are a lot more alerts than 10,000. Actually, if you just look at alerts based on, for example, servers, if you're a server administrator and you are managing Active Directory, you've got a lot of logs on there. If you look at a firewall uh, or next gen firewall, again, you can look at your monitor tabs, there's a lot of logs to kind of consume, consolidate, and try and stitch together everything, right? Again, when we talk about lowering response times uh, with automation, being able to take simple day-to-day -day tasks and be able to automate that, again, really drives down uh, response times in this scenario from three days to 25 minutes. I've seen some companies that will take them up to, up to almost a week to be able to respond to a specific incident, right? So we really want to kind of drive those times down. And then again, coordinating actions, right, across security products. So automated 30% of uh, incidents in this scenario, again, saves the uh, time for field time or for field engineers in this scenario as well. So to give you a look, I'm going to pause here for a second so you can have a quick squiz and see what it would be like for an analyst who has to go and do an investigation into multiple places, store multiple pieces of evidence, and this is pretty much what they would go through day to day. Some of the problems here, again, dis disparate alert sources, lack of defined processes, uh, repetitive manual actions, and lack of productivity or interconnectivity, right? So this is pretty much what you would see. If we look at adding Cortex XOR into the picture, we start being a little bit more pragmatic and saying, well, hang on, we actually can have a playbook, whether it's out of the box, the playbook, or whether it's something that we've now gone and created ourselves, we can really go and run a series of, of tasks, okay? And we can actually even prompt for manual intervention. So again, if Amanda in this scenario needs to go and have a look and actually go and say, well, I verify this and this is actually malicious and this can move on to the next phase, so be it, we can have the manual user inter interaction there, or we can leave it as completely automated as well, right? So again, very, very customizable in this scenario. From a deployment mode or models in this scenario, we've got different types of um, deployment options, which I think is quite nice and flexible for any one enterprise. So whether it be on-premise, you know, running it on a server, for example, whether it be customer virtual cloud or a hosted solution, there are very different manners to be able to kind of deploy the Cortex XOR. Um, again, having native multi-tenancy built in, these are some of the things that really kind of um, that kind of I find really kind of uh, vital inside the actual product itself. Looking at the differentiators, right, there's a wide variety here. So again, I'm not going to go through all of them, but some of my favorite ones in this, in this scenario are the flexible automation. Again, this gives us the ability to really leverage the current investment that enterprises have made in all sorts of technologies. Looking at, again, architecture security, uh, how code has been written, how it's been execute, executed in Docker, ensuring privacy, for example, sake. And again, continuous learning for me is also quite an interesting. So if you've got machine learning that helps increase the analyst productivity, uh, you'll see that there's a little bot called Dbot. 
and debug all the everything from emailing it to actually prompting you for suggestions as well from an analyst perspective. So again, these are some of the differentiators that uh, we have in Cortex XOR. All righty, so Cortex XOR with Threat Intel Management, just to have a look at this. So a typical analyst will struggle with, uh, with certain, certain elements in their day-to-day -day, uh, life, right? So things like lack of control. Unfortunately, again, there's threat feeds that force analysts here to manually tune and score IOCs in the environment. And it's, you know, that the analyst has a very difficult job, whether it be a tier one analyst, a tier three analyst. Again, just there is a lot of manual work in the scenario. There's siloed workflows as well. So again, you know, I spoke to a customer yesterday and the process of getting things done in their network and in their environment was just kind of mind blowing, to be honest. And again, if we think about things like hard to operationalize, you know, you need to kind of say, well, okay, in the event of a breach or an incident, I have this incident, this incident response plan, this is who I contact, this is what we're gonna do. And nine out of 10 times, that's not gonna be the case when it actually comes down to that, that D-Day moment. So again, introducing Cortex XOR here with native threat intel management as well. So again, taking complete control here, uh, making sure that you're making smarter and instant response decisions by enriching. And I think this is where Cortex XOR really kind of excels. The ability to enrich, the ability for me to go and leverage a virus total, IBM X Force, go and have a look and say, well, let me go and pull out of all these other feeds and really validate and see what's happening inside my, inside my enterprise, for example. Again, in this scenario, we're talking about taking full control here, and we can see a, uh, a screenshot over here where we've got things like our, our actual active and our bads, and we can go and have a look at reputational. We can go as far as looking at mapping, right? And again, we'll see this in the dashboards in a bit as to things like return on investment, right? So how do I know that Cortex XOR is really saving me manpower and man hours and automating tasks in my network. How do I prove to business that I have a return on investment? And we'll see in the demo on the top right hand side, I'll put a little, um, a little uh, a number, a little number scoring there that pretty much tells you what is the actual dollar value or the RAND value that you actually are saving, right? So again, in this scenario, we're looking at aggregating, passing, deduplicating, making sure that we've got uh, indicators at scale. And again, taking charge of throughout your threat uh, data as well. Um, just to give you an idea, this would be a, uh, also an idea of how an integration would be done, right? So if you look at the settings over here, we'd see integrations, and we can pretty much show all of them. We can show by type or by category, for example. So I could say network security or data enrichment and threat intelligence. And to add this is very simple. It's a matter of add instance. And from there, in this example, we've got autofocus here, which is the name. We'll then go look at our indicator feed. We'll then go use an API key for autofocus in the scenario. We'll click down test, and then we'll see that we've already got communications from Cortex XOR directly into autofocus for Threat Intel, right? And again, same can be said for whether you're utilizing things like Azure, Exchange on site, whether you're utilizing Office 365, Mimecast of the world, and all the rest. So again, looking at closing the loop here, um, again, in a playbook, we can really kind of automate these actions, right? So taking actions to shut down threats. Um, I was actually watching a very interesting little YouTube clip this morning around a education sector in the US where a, well, if you think about how schools and how users pretty much will kind of try use anonymizers and like, you know, these kind of little apps to kind of either uh, proxy out and try and kind of get out, bypass the next gen files or files in general. And I saw an administrator that basically decided, okay, well, you know, instead of trying to kind of like just block this user altogether, he was gonna utilize the MISTO in the scenario. So again, very simple kind of a context here. The firewall rule had two tags, one firewall rule that said, okay, well, the student's in this group. And if the student tried to go to, again, any of these kind of sites or identify this app, we would pretty much read it from syslog, have a look, and then drop this user dynamically into another group without even having to commit on a firewall. And again, I thought it was a very kind of a cool way to kind of enforce this utilizing the MISTO as well. Um, having a look at it from, a, from an overview perspective over here, um, again, this is a typical day in life of a security operations, what, what it would look like. And it all starts with an alert or a breaking threat on the news, uh, which kicks off an entire reactive process, right? So getting anything done is complex. It's generally manual. And again, requires working across multiple teams and tools. So this just gives you a really, you know, a, a kind of a broader view as to what, what, what things would look like day to day. 
So with Cortex XOR, again, we're taking full control of threat data and intel. We're unifying external threats, making smarter decisions, and really acting a lot faster with precision, right? There's no human error in the scenario. You know, in the scenario where we could make possible mistakes from being too tired or, you know, being having alert fatigue and so forth, we really are kind of working in a, in a more of a precise uh, manner as well. So I've tabled up some useful information for everyone. Um, these are just some links I thought that I would share just for kind of uh, for everyone's knowledge. So we have got the Cortex XOR website as well. We have an entire online com community, right? The deferred community, which is pretty much an open Slack community that you can join. Uh, we've got the support website. We've got YouTube channels, which will really give you some insights as to, you know, how else can I kind of best utilize this for my environment? And then again, just to look a little bit further, we've got a five-minute narrated demonstration um, utilizing threat intelligence platforms. Uh, we've got the RSA press release uh, running a SOC remotely, right? And if you look at how Palo Alto Networks runs our SOC, you know, we've got minimal engineers that actually kind of work in the SOC, and they only work eight to five. Why? Because a lot of the day-to-day -day tasks have been automated. So again, these are just some really kind of great links I thought I'd share with everyone. Alrighty, so talking about licensing for Cortex XOR, um, again, very simple in my mind because I've seen a lot of complicated licensing mechanisms and kind of skews in my life. But in, in this scenario, we talk about an annual subscription. The Cortex XOR's base license includes two analysts' admin seats, right? That's what you get out of the box. And uh, no consumption charges, right? And a lot of other technologies, you start talking about things like events per second and really kind of bolstering prices all the way through the roof, to be honest. Um, no in point charges in this either. So literally it's the base license, which includes two, anim uh, two analyst admin seats. And if you wanted additional uh, add-ons or additional uh, analyst seats, you can definitely purchase those as well. Um, again, this is pretty much aligned with predicted budgets. And I think this is what a lot of customers are and we do enjoy about the actual uh, technology itself. Alrighty, guys, I've got a couple more slides, so I'm hopefully going to make it on time plus a demo. Um, I've got a use case here, which is for phishing. Um, again, knowing that 95% of all the text pretty much comes across email, and we try as best as we can to put a lot of uh, controls in place. Uh, but unfortunately, things do slip through the cracks, and again, whether it's things are seen or unseen, we do have this scenario. So how do we kind of utilize this? Uh, how do we utilize Cortex XOR here, right? So again, a high load of volumes, right? So we can't track all of the volumes. It's, it's a lot of information that comes through. They're just jointed processes in every enterprise, more than likely. And again, whether it's threat intel, next gen firewalls, ticketing, other tools for phishing response. You know, we think that by pointing our MX records to somewhere else in the world, and hopefully the server scrubs it and it comes and gets delivered internally. There are scenarios that are actually a little bit disjointed. And then again, we look at the ever, ever present and growing, right? So again, a lot of attacks, a lot of spear phishing, a lot of targeted attacks on, on, uh, on people. So this is what we would look at, look like in the beginning, right? So on the before on the left-hand side, you would have a security analyst. Again, this person would have to go do a manual triage or a manual kind of uh, expedition to go look at all bits and pieces throughout the network. So let me go log on to my threat intelligence uh, or my uh, interface and go and have a look there. Let me go and collect some information from a scene. Let me go detonate a file, whether it be in wildfire or any other kind of sandboxes. Let me then go and look at the EDRs or XDRs. Let me go raise severities. Let me open a ticket. Again, it's all very manual in this process. Looking at from the right-hand side, We'll be able to ingest an email, right? Or even have a mailbox sent where we can actually go look at all of the mails for, for phishing, right? In that perspective here, we are doing extraction, we're doing enrichment, we're checking threat intels, we're checking the scene, we're checking the sandbox in the scenario. And from an output perspective, here we can see ticketing has been integrated, right? With you service now, Zendesk, and so forth. Severities have been set already, because again, if we've now found that the indicator compromise in the scenario is high enough, we're going to set that severity to high. It's automatically going to email out, right? And we can have multiple views, whether it be the analysts, whether it be different teams as well, just give you an idea as to how we would really kind of uh, make this process a lot smoother as well. So in this scenario here, product integrations, fantastic playbooks that are out of the box as well. And again, thousands of automated actions across security tools. So just give me a quick idea there. Another use case for us here, if we look at security processes and automation, um, again, <laughs> I find myself to be a very lazy engineer. If I can do something or automate something quicker, that's the route I'm definitely going to take. But in this scenario, again, you know, teams are siloed. Um, again, not everyone talks to everyone, um, whether you're a DevOps, whether you're a network engineer. 
there is shifting context, right? So again, in this scenario, we talk about, you know, having to rework fragmented documentation, documentation that's outdated, for example, and lack of metrics. You know, how do I know the time that I'm spending, the mean time to detect, the mean time to respond, for example. So having a look at this approach here, so again, whether I'm a firewall admin, whether I'm part of the internal IT team, or whether I'm a DevOps engineer, again, there's different places where data flows in and out, right? So whether it be, again, emails, ticketing, EDRs, and looking at how we would kind of solve that problem today and say, well, hang on, I can take all these alert sources, I can ingest, I can enrich, I can respond, and I can really kind of make it a lot more valuable for additional teams to kind of have the right insights for that security analyst to really kind of ease his life and kind of free his time up so he can do the more important threat hunting. That's really where we want to get to, the stage we want to get to. Again, here, we're talking about cross-team communications. Again, we'll be utilizing collaboration within the war rooms, for example. We'll look at doing security-focused context as well, so really giving us an idea about the attack life cycle and really be able to respond to that. And then again, granular dashboards, right? So there are... There are needs for dashboards and I, for one, am a fan of dashboards and widgets. So if I have something that's kind of visual for me, I can understand and then really kind of make informed decisions as well. So having said that, I'm going to drop into a quick demo here and we can have a look and see what the Cortex XOR pretty much looks like. So just a quick overview. Um, I'm going to take you through a walkthrough in the actual interface itself. I'm going to go create a new incident for a phishing attack in the scenario. We're going to go look into the playbooks, the work plans, the war rooms, and get a good feel for what we have in Cortex XOR. All righty, so having a quick squiz, welcome to Cortex XOR. What we are seeing right now is the home dashboard in this scenario. Um, if I go and just quickly manipulate here and change the time values, we can see a good amount of widgets here, right? So again, in this scenario, I can see active incidents by severity. So again, I can know that I have a low and medium of X amount, but I only really have 19 critical X amount of high that I really need to be focused on. Again, I can see incidents that are assigned by user. So who's been assigned what in the scenario. I can go and have a look at the unassigned incidents, late incidents. Again, we were talking about metrics and tracking. This gives us some more insights. And again, we can see here with regards to the um, machine learning and DBOT, we can see exactly how much time has actually been, uh, how much money has been saved in the environment by automating certain tasks. All right, so having a look at this here, what I really want to go and do is, well, I want to go create a new incident, right? So in this scenario, incidents can be ingested in different manners. I'm going to create it manually over here. So I'm going to go and say, well, let's create a new incident. And I want to look at a phishing incident, right? So phishing campaign here, and I'm going to go create a new incident. So you'll see over here in uh, the middle of our screen, I've got a new ID over here. And we're going to go and have a look and see how this actually works out for us. So again, I'm triggering this manually, but you can have this automatically set up, whether it's ingesting via email, mail listeners, and so forth. So if I click through on the actual uh, incident ID over here, we'll see that we've now got, and it's really been closed, right? Look at that for automation. I didn't even have to do much. But if you have a look at through this, right, we can see things like basic information. We can understand different severities. We can understand who the admin owners are. We can go and have a look at things like incident info, right? So let's get some more some more information around it, right? So whether it be timeline information, indicators, investigation data, work plans, and so forth, we can understand a lot more. And when I was speaking about the war room, the war room is pretty much this, right? So I can go and add multiple users to this war room, and we can go and mark things for evidence, go and check certain items, right? I've even got the ability at the bottom here to pretty much go type certain commands. Whether I want to go get an AD user, for example, and I get a preemptive of uh, a next kind of query. Do I want to go have a look for the DN? Do I want to go look for their mail addresses? These are certain commands that we can run to kind of actually have a look and trigger this in the war room to uh, really kind of get to, uh, uh, to understanding of a certain incident, for example. We can also have a look at the work plan, and this will pretty much show us the flow of the actual uh, playbook. And we'll come back to this in a second. Uh, we have an evidence board as well. So again, we can go and select certain things and mark it as evidence. Again, we can look at things that are related incidents. So how many phishing mails have I seen over a period of time? Um, are they all related? Is this a campaign that's kind of coming out for, for uh, phishing in this scenario that's, that's actually targeting more of my users? And then I can also have a look at it from a canvas perspective and understand what has actually been closed, what has actually been done, and we can get a quick view into, into certain incidents. 
Now, when we're talking about playbooks, and I'll come back to our work plan, when we look at our playbooks over here, we'll be able to see that we've got a variety of different playbooks, and I'll showcase that to you now. But here's an idea of what a playbook would look like, right? So this is my demo for phishing playbook. I'd be able to go and review my status, select an analyst, uh, set severities, assign it to an analyst, right? Then we go through a, almost a two branch uh, left and right. And on the right hand of the branch, we'll see that we're actually starting to process the email, we're rasterizing the email. And while we're doing that, we're getting certain information, right? We're understanding who the AD user is, for example. We're understanding who the department or the department info. We're sending an automated acknowledgement to that actual recipient as well. But while we're doing that, we're extracting IPs from, e uh, from the uh, IP addresses from the email, we're extracting URLs, and this is where we start doing the enrichment, right? And we'll see the enrichment playbook runs, and we then make a decision and say, well, hang on, was there any malicious indicators found? Um, if no, fantastic, let's take the left path. If yes, take another path. And again, we'll go and detonate the files, for example, say, Kim, we'll go and check uh, the sender's domain to go and have a look at certain things, right? And again, we run through a series of different tasks here. And again, you can make it as complex as you want. You can use out of the box playbooks. But this gives us a really good idea of what we can pretty much go and see. Now, coming back to our playbook, our playbook that we just ran, I want to kind of give you an idea here. Let's go have a look at instance again. Let's go grab our playbook. Okay. So if we go and have a look and see. Our work plan. See so now, we're, again, we're starting to have a look at more information that's coming through, right? So again, what we what wasn't populated is now being populated. So again, we can see malicious indicators. Uh, Dbot's coming back with some some uh, suggestions for us as well. You can see that I've actually even got a. It's waiting for a response on myself as a security analyst to take uh, action, right? So we have a look at the work plan quickly. We can understand what was actually run in this playbook. And you'll see that because it actually, all the little blocks turned green. So we know that it ran. So we know that it actually went and looked at incident details. We can see what has been processed. We can then go a little bit further and say, hang on, was there any malicious indicator found? And in this scenario, it didn't go the no path. It was yes, there was something malicious. And we follow the path, right? So we're updating progress. We're setting severities. We're then saying, hang on a second, we need to obviously now go and search in, uh, in the malicious email for in other mailboxes, right? So hang on a second, we found this one incident. Let me go check other email boxes and make sure that this is not the same case in other places. So as we go through here, we'll see that we've got uh, setting more of a critical severity here. We're hunting for the bad IOCs or the indicators of compromise, but we actually not prompted. So we, the playbook has stopped right here. So what are we saying here? It's that there's action, action for the analyst, you know? So in this scenario, we're saying, well, hang on. Do you want to investigate this further? Do we want to add some comments here? And I'm going to, at the analyst, I'm going to say, yes, this is a malice. This is, this is a virus. And this is a virus, for example, say, so, yeah. And then I'm going to mark this as complete. And as I mark as complete, all right, it will then go and then run the rest of the book and say, well, hang on a second. It has been confirmed update the incident, check the criticality, perform another remediation task. So it's asking the analyst again, please hang on a second, let's double check this and verify this, right? So again, I will go and do and uh, make sure the remediation is correct, make sure that my input is okay, and then pretty much go run through the rest of the playbook. And then it says, hang on, well, we've done everything. We've, we've checked all the, um, all the different statuses. Are you ready to confirm this is closed? So in my scenario, yes, I'm happy. I want to have this closed. And then we can say, well, hang on. Okay, well, that's done. And the case is closed. So you're awesome, right? So again, just showing you how quickly and easily that we can pretty much go stitch together, understand, pull in integrations from different places and, and really kind of automate a task that would take X amount of time for a user, right? Having a look again back at the dashboard, we can pretty much go back here. And sorry, what I didn't notice, I'm not going to open up right now, but I would have had emails directly from Cortex XOR, right? Telling me that what stage this was at, asking for my intervention, asking me to come back and have a look here as well. So uh, again, just gives us some nice ideas here as well. Again, we can customize and add dashboards and widgets here to whatever kind of would suit the enterprise's needs. Um, if we have a look at system health, for example, say here, we can have a look at things like the general Cortex XOR system health. So yeah, I've got enough disk, my CPU and so forth. So the actual uh, Cortex XOR is working quite nicely. I can go have a look at things like my dashboards here, my personal dashboards. Again, I can go and uh, configure this, but this really also shows me, you know, my mean time to resolution here as well, how many incidents I've dealt with. From an SLA perspective, 
this is where, again, business might find a lot more value to say, well, hang on, let's have a look and see what is our mean time to detection? What is our mean time to resolve? You know, this, this can be so applicable to many different uh, verticals and different kind of um, companies and enterprises, you know, and again, we can go have a look at this from a compliance perspective. Uh, we might want to have a look at this from uh, email malware. Impossible traveler, if I'm logging in from two places at the same time, hang on a second, that doesn't sound right. You know, I can align to certain frameworks as well. So again, things like NIST and so forth, plugging into clouds, for example, say, right? Um, again, a lot of different um, uh, abilities to kind of utilize here as well. So if we look at the threat intel management here as well, again, we can see the number of active in, uh, indicators. We can see the number of expired indicators. And again, we can see here the volumes of feeds, right? So in most companies, you would have a couple of feeds, maybe two, three, four, depending. But pretty much you can not, not very limited. You can pretty much have whatever you want. So again, Lee was mentioning the MITRE attack framework. You might want to have a look at, again, um, maybe autofocus in the scenario, maybe some others, whether it be emerging threats, uh, normalized stack, taxi and stick servers as well. And again, just showing us what we can pretty much see here. From that perspective, again, you would want to be able to pull some reports as well. So again, we would be able to go and run a monthly CISO report, a critical and high incidents. We want to go maybe detail that a little bit further. So it gives us the ability to really kind of run through and pull various reports and configure the reports as we need as well, right? Um, I think that is pretty much good to go. Yeah, happiness. Uh, I think I saw a question pop up there, but I'm sure that's going to be answered. Before we close our company machines, will Excel will be able to work side by side with it? Cross degradation performance. Uh, I'm sure you're going to, anonymous, I'm sure you're going to get that question answered there. Um, I do have an answer to that, uh, but I'll actually let uh, one of the panelists take that for me as well. Um, guys, that's pretty much to wrap up the demo. Um, that is what I really wanted to showcase to you today and just really the power of uh, the power of Cortex XOR. Um, if you do, I'm going to leave a couple minutes here for Q&A as well. So I'm not going to dig any further in, into the interface here. Um, let me come back to where we are here. So thank you for your time this morning. Um, that was pretty much just a rundown around Cortex XOR. Um, and then I think I'm going to park here and I'm going to hand back over to, I'm going to hand the ball to Sarita or to Chantal. Thank you very much. Yes, good morning, Jakes. Thank you so much for you and Lee's time. We really appreciate it. And I really hope that this was a, a good session for our participants to, to partake in this morning. So thank you very much for that. I am quickly going to hand over to Matt, who is also on the call to just assist us with um, answering uh, one of two of the questions that has been uh, given to us. So I know that our one attendee has already left that has the query around um, the Zoom, for, you know, the Zoom security um, challenges that some companies are facing. And he would just like to know, you know, from a Palo Alto perspective, um, how, do, how do you guys deal with that? In terms of Zoom, did you say, Chantal? Yes, correct. So one of the questions that we had is, as a security company using mm -hmm. Zoom, um, how do you answer to critics of Zoom? Yes, so we've just uh, upgraded our security with Zoom. So every meeting invite we send out now has password um, to go with it, because I think over the last few weeks with people working from home, I think there was a lot of, I think it was called Zoom bombing. Um, so, um, so we upgraded our security internally and we, I think it was the last couple of weeks we had to kind of revamp Zoom, but, but yeah, we just started using passwords mainly. Perfect. Um, then maybe for Patrick, for him to answer, I see he did answer in the, in the Q and A chat box, but, uh, Patrick, one of the questions was that the customers use or the partner use 40 clients in their company. And will Excel be able to work side by side with it? Will this cause a de de ooh, sorry, degradation in performance? Um, no, to be honest, because um, yeah, we've got a, a lot of clients that use 40 clients, but that obviously feeds to their 40 gate stack. Um, I, like I said, I was, I'm, I'm interested to know specifically around the type of events that you get from 40 client, but Xor isn't an agent that exists on, on, the, on the endpoints. Um, XOR is, is kind of like the fabric that put that uh, or the glue that um, you know, put pieces all your infrastructure together. So I mentioned one use case around um, 40 gate. If you get a security incident for maybe a bad IP address that you've fed through your threat intelligence through XOR, 
then we can automate or semi-automate that response to um, maybe add a, a malicious IP to a, to a blacklist of your 40 gates. Um, like we do that with, with our PANOS operating system and Checkpoint and all of the others as well. So um, yeah, I'm interested to know your use case on that one. I'm happy to, to take that one offline. Perfect. And just a final question for you, please, Patrick. Um, another question was uh, that there were no comparisons mentioned in regards to Alien Build, for instance. If you can maybe just elaborate on that. I saw that you did respond that um, you assume that they refer to, to um, Alien Build Sim. Yeah, yeah. So I, I know Alien Vault Seam and I know they have threat intelligence as well, um, which plugs into their Seam, but I, I don't see um, Seam as competitive to XDR or um, XSOR, to be honest with you. Um, XDR doesn't do things like, you know, long term uh, archival of logs for seven years, you know, compressed seven to one. What it does give you is that um, platform to be able to respond quicker than you would with a Seam. Um, seems a great at creating a, a, a like a correlation alert that then an analyst has to do something with. But XDR does that for you. Um, you know, if if, if a seam spits out five alerts, then that's five instances that you've got to investigate. Whereas XDR bundles those into one, so you get a central view. You only get one analyst working on one instance at a time. So um, and like seams, they they again they're not agent based. Um, whereas XDR has an agent that exists on the endpoint and therefore is able to enforce. Uh, prevent um, uh, execution, prevent privilege escalation and uh, exploitation of a host um, versus a scene that would just take logs and then create an alert for an analyst to look at. Perfect. Thank you so much. So guys, I see that all the questions have been answered. I don't know if there's anyone else that has any questions if you would like one of our experts to answer. If there's not anything on your side, I would just like to remind you to stay online to complete the quick survey. Sorry, I see that they would like a copy of the slides. Daniel, I've taken a note and we will reach out to you in regards to your queries. We will share the website addresses and copies of the slides with you guys after the presentation. Then just quickly from my side, guys, um, we would just like to make you aware that we will have another Q&A webinar, but this time it will be based specifically around the cloud portfolio called Prisma. The session will be hosted on the 29th of April. And after this call, you will receive a um, email with all the registration details. Should you be interested in joining us for that webinar? So we have no further open questions and we will um, share the survey with you. Guys, thank you very much for participating this morning. We really appreciate your time. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.